Thanks so much for joining us today. Our hope and prayer is that God will use this message powerfully in your life and that it'll bring you closer to Him. If you'd like more information about our church or if you'd like to hear more messages, you can visit vibechurch.com or download our app. Now get ready to receive a word from the Lord. Guys, I don't know what's going on with Randy today. He's got the jokes. Um, the first thing he told me this morning when he walked in, he's like, I'm glad you pull up your fanciest suit to preach. And I looked at myself and I was like, well, at least I can pull it off. <laughs> can you guys know what my shirt says without me exposing the rest of the message? Just do it, right? It's one of the slogans, Nike slogans that he's been used the most. Uh, it's been going on since the 80s. Um, and it's recognizable everywhere. Well, today we're going to do just that. Just do it. And um, before we start, I want to remind you that we're in this sermon series called Do You See What I See? And uh, we've been looking at uh, a Christmas story from the fresh uh, point of view of some of the other characters. And you see, Usually at Christmas time, us preachers love to spend a lot of time talking about Jesus' miraculous conception, and that's okay because that's at the core of our faith, right? That's, that's, that's basically what we believe, that Jesus was born from the Virgin Mary, and we spend a lot of time with that, and, and that's, that's fine. But the fact that Jesus was born from a virgin leads us to think about the fact that Jesus was Conceive apart from any human father. And Jesus did not have a biological father. And so naturally, and rightly so, we start thinking of Jesus' father as only our heavenly father, God. And we tend to forget about the fact that Jesus did have a foster father here on earth. An earthly father, Joseph. And I want today to spend some time looking at the life of Joseph and looking at the story of Christmas through the eyes of these amazing men. I rarely hear a message on Joseph, the father of Jesus. And most of the time we're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and we talk about the rest of the story, but we forget about Joseph. And he mostly gets overlooked during Christmas time, but today I want to Uh, talk to you about the forgotten father of Christmas, Joseph. And the fact that Joseph gets overlooked doesn't mean that we should underestimate the lessons we can learn from his life, because it wasn't easy. Christmas time for Joseph was not easy. I think somebody else mentioned it in the last couple weeks, but today we celebrate Christmas, and we know the end of the story, but for Joseph it was different. He didn't know the end of the story, it took a lot of faith, it took a lot of courage, and it took, it took him everything he had to go on with the story without knowing the rest of the script. And it's funny to think that God had every man in, in history, every man that was alive at, at that time to pick from, but he picked Joseph. Why Joseph? I mean, if you think about it, Joseph was a direct descendant of Abraham, of Solomon, of David. I mean, David, come on. If I was God, I would have picked David, especially during the time that he was king. I mean, that would be more, more of a, an appropriate birth, right? He will be royal. He will be royalty. He will be a king, immediately a prince. That would be perfect. But no, he picks Joseph. And the Bible doesn't tell us why he picks Joseph, but I have a theory. And I, I have a suspicion that the reason why God chose Joseph to be the father of Jesus here on earth is because of the same reason that God picked Abraham to be the father of nations. Obedience. Obedience and faith. Unbreakable faith. And we can read about uh, Abraham's obedience in Genesis 18, but... We can summarize this as God knew what kind of man Abraham was. God knew that if he asked Abraham to do something, he was going to do it. And I believe that God chose Joseph for the same reason. Because he knew that if he asked Joseph to do something, he was just going to do it. Just going to do it. And God knew that 
the kind of man Joseph was. He was a man of integrity. And he will just do it. And you see, the obedience, obedience for God is a big deal. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, obedience to God is a big deal. So obey, obey. You see, look at what 1 John says in chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. It says, if someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, then that person is a liar. And he's not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how much they love God. That is how we know we are living in God. Those who say that they abide in God should also walk just like Jesus did. So obedience is a big deal to God. Not because we, He wants to control us, but because He knows best. He knows what's best for you and me. And He has read the final chapter of our story. And He has a plan to prosper each one of us. And He has a plan to give you life. And His commandments are not there just to make your life difficult. They're a roadmap. A roadmap to the promises He has for you and for me. And to follow these instructions is just common sense. It's what we ought to do if we want to is discover what God has in store for us. So Joseph was chosen because of his obedience. And if you notice, Matthew says in verses 1 and 2, in, in chapters 1 and 2, that the beginning of the gospel of Matthew, he starts talking about the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And he starts listing all the, all the men before Joseph. Because men were important in that time. In that time. And, 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 and he doesn't overlook the fact that Joseph is not really the, the bloodline of Jesus. But he takes the time to list all these men because it was it, not be, just because it was a promise that the, the Messiah was going to be born for the, from, from David, from David's lineage. But when he gets to the end and he says, And ja Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom, whom, who was born Jesus, who is called Christ. We get to understand that Joseph's lineage comes all the way from Abraham. And so I think Matthew makes a point because not just, they, they don't just share a bloodline, but they also share a lot of similarities in their character. And I believe that God chose Joseph because he knew Joseph will obey. Joseph then is an outstanding example of obedience. And what we learn from Joseph has a lot to do with obedience that we need to perform today. The same kind of obedience that just gets things done. And for me, Joseph's stakes on the story of Christmas was, God knows best, so I'll just do it. <laughs> if you were to think of the first Christmas as a movie, and you, you know that movies have main characters, and they have leading roles, and they have supporting roles, and they have the extras, right? Well, mo most people will look at the story of Christmas and they will say that Joseph was just an extra in this movie. He was not a leading role. He was not a leading man. And the reason is because he never speaks during the two accounts of the story of Christmas. He never speaks. Not even one word. Joseph doesn't even, Joseph doesn't even get one line. I remember when I was two, uh, in second or third grade, I was in, participating in a Christmas play. And I was little, uh, but they, they let me have one line. And I was in the play, and they had let me have one line. But I was not even in the play, the play. I was the guy that came up on stage before the curtains even opened and said, Merry Christmas to all, and to all mankind, peace on earth. That was it. And then the music will play and the curtains will open and the play will start. And that was my line. But at least I got a line. Joseph didn't even get a line. He didn't even get that much because we don't hear Joseph speaking. It's easy for us to assume that he is not important to the story of Christmas. 
But I want you to notice that Joseph is very significant to the way the entire Christmas story played out and develops. You see, when you and I read the gospel accounts of the first Christmas, even though we don't hear Joseph speak, we can see him move. We can see what he does. He doesn't talk, but he moves. He listens and he obeys. Joseph is a man of action. And God talks to Joseph three or four times. And we don't see a recording of Joseph's response. We just see him react to that, to God talking in obedience. There's only action. When we see Joseph listening to God speaking, we see Joseph moving. When we see Joseph moving his family from one location to another, we don't see him talking. He just moves. We see Joseph struggling with his conscience, and the Bible describes that he's struggling with the decision of divorcing Mary or marrying Mary after she, he, he finds out that she's pregnant with somebody else's baby. And rather than listen to Joseph's questions and arguing, or we just see him moving into a quick and absolute obedience. Now watch how he responds to the angel, telling him what to do on a dream. He didn't even get the full picture of, a, of, a, of an angel in real life. He just got a dream of an angel. And he gets up, he wakes up, and he gets it done. We see Joseph over and over again do rather than listening to him speak. And I happen to think that none of these is by accident, guys. I believe that God cast Joseph for this specific role of the Christmas story because his actions speak louder than his words. And Joseph was, a, a, I believe, the kind of man who spoke softly and he was a man of few words, but he was perhaps a man that didn't need to speak to deliver a message. And that's pretty impressive. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is recorded speaking seven times. Seven times. She even gets to sing a song. A whole chapter of Mary singing. I wish the Bible would say if she sang well or not. Because, you know, that would, that would be tragic if it's a bad karaoke. But she gets to sing. She gets to speak. She gets to ask, ask questions. Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, they're both recorded speaking in the Bible. Simeon, the old man who was promised by God that he will not die before seeing Jesus with his own eyes. He was recorded speaking. Anna is reported to, have a, to go out and tell everybody about Jesus. Even the angel Gabriel gets speaking lines in the story of Christmas. But not Joseph. And if you don't believe me, go back home and read the two gospels that tell the Christmas story. There's no one word of Joseph. And this is the bottom line. Who you are speaks louder than what you say. Who you are speaks louder than what you say. Now let me ask you something. What are people saying about you? I'm not asking you what you say you are. What you think you are. What you're promoting yourself as. I'm asking you, what do you think people think about you? Is your word worth anything? Are you walking the talk? You see, Joseph's, Joseph's character and actions spoke for themselves. He didn't have to speak much. His life preached a better sermon than his words could ever have. Joseph was a man of action and a man of obedience. And when he came to God speaking to him, he didn't play games. He was just going to do it. Just do it. So let's read the Christmas story in Matthew verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 18, 21. It says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. How convenient. Joseph, 
to whom she was engaged was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And Joseph, son of David, said the angel. The angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son. And you are to name, name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. So now this is the story. This is the angel talking to Joseph, and we see what happens when he wakes up in verse 24. And he says that when jo Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relationships with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. So if you see in these Bible verses, Joseph doesn't speak a word. He thinks. He sleeps. I don't even know how he can sleep after a news like that, right? But he sleeps. He dreams. He sees. He listens. And then he obeys by marrying with uh, Mary and naming the baby Jesus. And that sounds like a short version of the story. And his actions, but his actions speak loudly. His actions scream off the page as you're reading them. And he tells us that he had a firm belief that God knew best, and he was just going to do it. I mean, if you read the Bible, Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, doubted and denied the command of God, and God made him mute. He spoke so much that God made him mute until his son John was born. Mary responded with a question to the angel. She get to ask questions. She get to sing a song like I told you earlier. But Joseph simply got up after dreaming and he went and do it. Joseph would have been the perfect man to carry out the Nike slogan, just do it, right? Just do it. Just do it. No questions asked. No complaints. Just do it. No games. No gimmicks. Just do it. Just obey what God tells you to do. It will take so much courage for us to do something like that, right? To live lives like that. To, be, to have the faith to just do what God is asking us to do. So Joseph has a few lessons to teach us with his actions. And let me ask you something. Is this the way you live? Is this the, way, the kind of relationship that you have with the Lord? He speaks, you do. Do you have the courage to just do it? You see, God has bigger plans next time he says, go, just do it. If he says, wait, just do it. If he says, forgive someone, just do it. When he says, it's time, then just do it. If he says, wait, just do it. If he says, you got to give something, just do it. If he's challenged you to change or to serve, just do it. And even if you feel inadequate, just do it. He'll prove you wrong. <laughs> if he's leading you to repentance, then just do it. Stop asking questions. And stop asking if you're worthy. Stop asking if you're enough. Just do it. Repent. Come to the Lord. If he calls you to worship, just do it. And you may say, well, I'm in the middle of a storm. I'm going through this. I'm going through that. It doesn't matter. Just do it. Just do it. If he's asking you to pray, just do it. You see, we were not called to ask questions. We were just called to obey. And I'm not saying it's, 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 it's a sin to ask questions to the Lord. I mean, we see multiple, multiple accounts in the Bible where people were complaining and asking questions. And it took them a while to believe, to have faith and courage to just obey. But let me tell you something. At the end of the day, you're going to have to do it. So just save yourself some time and do it. I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to tell me, uh, she used an acronym, uh, TIA. And TIA in Spanish is uh, the word for uh, ant. Not the little insect. I always get that word. Uh, my, like my mother's 
sister, aunt. I always get it like just, just wrong enough, the pronunciation, so you think that it, I'm talking about an insect. No, Tia is my aunt, my mom's sister. And she used that acronym to tell us how we needed to obey. Totalmente, inmediatamente y alegremente. She said, you need to obey totalmente, inmediatamente y alegremente. I still remember, totally, immediately, and with joy. It's about the attitude of the heart. You have to obey. And I remember throwing a fit every time she sent me to wash dishes. That's why I don't wash dishes anymore. I remember throwing a fit when I had to pick up my room. I remember throwing a fit when I had to study for a test, when I had to do homework. I remember throwing a fit when I had to rake the leaves of my yard. And as soon as I was done, the leaves were already there again. And I had to complain. And my mom was like, at the end of the day, you're going to have to do it. So don't ask why. Just do it. Just do it. And when it comes to the Lord, it's the same thing. It's not worth it, guys. You, need, you see, sometimes when God doesn't reveal the end of the story, He's trying to spare you. Because if He tells you what the things that you're going to go through, you're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe it. I'm a living proof of that. And I know that God has to give me nuggets of the next steps that He's taking me. Just nuggets. Because if he gives me the whole picture, I will get so scared. The emotions and the, and the doubts and everything in my mind will be so much that will, will, it will consume me. And he knows that I just got to trust and take that first step. Amen? Amen? So just do it. See, obedience is the first step into God's amazing story for your life. But it's also the hardest step to take. That first step is the hardest. But if you don't take it, you will miss out. You will miss out on the amazing story that God has for you. You need to take that first step. Don't ask questions. Don't ask why. Get up and do it. Just do it. Joseph had an incredible obedience. But that doesn't mean that he was not afraid. I mean, the Bible tells us that he was afraid. That's why the angel, the first thing that said is, Joseph, in the, in the dream, right? Joseph, do not be afraid. It doesn't mean that he had it all figured out. It doesn't mean that it was going to be easy to marry someone. Back in the day, like we've been talking in the last couple of weeks, it was a big deal that your fiance was pregnant before marriage and and he wasn't even your child. I mean, it's still a big deal today. I will be frightened. But you know what? Joseph was about to become the joke of the town. Of course he was afraid. But this is the first lesson we can learn from him. We need to obey God despite of our fears. Not with the fears are gone. Because they will be there. But despite of all of our fears, we need to trust God and take that first step and just obey. Just do it. Can you imagine at this point of his life, Joseph was probably so scared. This is probably not the way he imagined his wedding night. This is not the way he imagined to spend his honeymoon Fleeing from an assassin that was threatening to kill your son and your wife and maybe yourself. This was not ideal for Joseph. He did not have an idea of what he was getting into by saying yes to God. He didn't know. And I'm sure there were moments when he was so scared, so scared. But his actions speak louder than his words. He was always there. He was always there. And what, what do you think his actions say? They say, I trust in God. I trust God's word. Even though I'm afraid, I will trust him and I will do what he says. Is that what you do? 
Is that what you and I do? When you are afraid, do you trust Him? When you're facing a bad diagnosis from a doctor, do you trust Him? When you look at your bank account and you know you're in trouble, do you trust Him? Or is He only your God when things are going right? Do you trust God? You see, you can come here and we can sing about how much we trust Him, how much we love Him. We can come here and sing, I'm available. Here I am. You can have it all. But you know, our words do not impress God. Our actions do. I'm not telling you not to sing. I'm not telling you that from now on we're like the Dalai Lama and we don't speak anymore. <laughs> we take a, a, sil a silent boat, right? Oh, uh, 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 so, uh, bow. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you that your words have to match your actions. Just like Joseph did. Jesus said, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is, this is serious, guys. It means that there could be people among us that are here every Sunday, lifting their hands and raising hands and worshiping and giving and doing this, and they may not make it to heaven. They may not make it to the kingdom of God. And it doesn't take much to get to the kingdom of heaven. The price was already paid. It's already paid. But our actions have to match our words. We cannot leave. I've been beating this drum for a long time. We cannot have just a religion. We need a relationship with the Lord. It has to be real. He can smell fake from miles away. He can smell fake from miles away. And obedience is going is gonna, to is gonna take some sacrifice. This is the second lesson that we can learn from this. Obedience will require a sacrifice and trust. You see, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You can't pick up an end of a stick without lifting the other end. It's just physics. And actions have consequences. It is the same with our obedience. It's like a domino effect. One gets knocked down, the, the last one will get knocked down. Our behaviors create results. And this is also true when we decide to obey God. Obedience has a consequence. And there's always a reward. There's always a happy ending when we obey God. But in the middle, in that, that place in the middle, things can get difficult. I said it before, and I said it again, there cannot be resurrection without death. You want to see resurrection? Something has to go to the altar. Something has to be sacrificed. We're about to start a new year and everybody's going to start setting new goals and this and that. You know what? If you want to reach those goals, it's going to take sacrifice. And the same thing happens with God. As soon as you decide to obey, you can be, you, you can get, I can guarantee you that there's going to be a happy ending. But in the middle, it's when you have to keep your, keep your eyes on Jesus. Because obedience will require faith. Obedience is a step into the unknown. A change of plans. A new direction. A new and unwanted new beginning. And if you look at verses in Matthew 1, it took Joseph, uh, I mean, yeah, in Matthew 1 verses 24, it took Joseph some courage to stick to the plan. I mean, he woke up and he married Mary, but he also didn't have any sexual relationships with her until his son was born. Like I said before, I don't think he was, this was the plan he had for his wedding. It was already scary to marry someone. <laughs> Can you imagine? He was a young man, and I bet he took a lot of restraint on his part to wait. I don't think he planned on, on, on fleeing 
the country. I don't think he, 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 he knew that obeying God was going to mean that he will have to leave Bethlehem and take his family to Egypt. Or that he was going to have to spend some sleepless nights, anxious, knowing that at, at any moment, a given moment, someone can come and assess his kid and his wife in the middle of the night. You see, Joseph didn't know that obeying God would mean that he would settle in Nazareth rather than come home to Bethlehem. But let me tell you, if you have your eyes placed on God and Jesus, it will be so much easier. It's been a few times, and I know there's some families here that have been involved in missions and ministry, and, and it takes courage. Every time God asks you, pack your stuff and go, it takes courage. For Sarita and I, when we decided to give our lives to ministry, we had no clue. We had no clue where God was going to take us. And it's been crazy. It's been a crazy, amazing adventure. But there's been times that it's only sacrifice, only sacrifice, only sacrifice. And you saw and you saw and you saw and you don't see the fruits of your labor. And every time God tells you to go and you close your eyes and you say, God, it's scary. But you do it, God it's on your side. God is on your side and he comes, he comes through for you. And he has been a journey and an adventure. Every time we step up in faith, God proves himself. And he says, hey, I told you, this is what I wanted you to do. Hasn't been easy. Hasn't been easy. But I'm understanding now more these days. Let me give you a warning. Your obedience will set you in a collision path with Satan. And and earlier, when we were going through the notes to put him on the screen, they were asking me, isn't it your disobedience? I'm like, no, your obedience. Your obedience will set you on a collision path with Satan because as soon as you decide to obey God, Satan will do everything in his power to redirect you from following God because he knows that when you obey God's will is being done in you and through you. And maybe you can see it now, but Satan knows you play an important role in God's unfolding story. It doesn't mean that if you're not here on stage, you don't have an important role. We had this conversation this week with someone, and I was telling him, you know, it doesn't mean that you, if you're not up there, you're not important. Joseph didn't even get a line. That doesn't mean he didn't have any influence. That doesn't mean that he didn't change the story of Christmas forever. The Bible says that Joseph was a righteous man. And this was his chance to prove it. And the fact that he was known as a righteous man did not guarantee that he would make the right choice. Because let me tell you something. He had a choice. He could have said no. He could have said no and just run away. He had all rights by law. To just leave Mary. But he said yes. You see, even good people get derailed from God's plan because they decide to follow their own instincts rather than get God's will for their lives. And believe me when I say the loss and the price of disobedience is way higher than the price we pay when we obey God. It's way higher. Way higher. When wealth is lost, somebody said this, when wealth is lost, you lose nothing. When health is lost, you lose something. And when you lose your character, you lose everything. And Joseph knew this. Joseph knew that he was known as a righteous man. And this was his chance to prove everybody right. To prove God that he was the one that he should have chosen. And Joseph obedience made him go down in history, not like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Oh my gosh, that's like a tongue twister for me. (laughs) He went down in history as one of the heroes of Christmas because he lived firsthand the birth of our Jesus, Lord and Savior. He provided for him. He watched him grow. Can you imagine how cool that was? I mean, we're talking about these his life today, thousands of years after, because obedience gives you influence. When you obey God, 
you're going to be able to influence others into doing the same thing, into following you and following Jesus. Think about the role Joseph was playing. I mean, let me suggest something. You just have to look at the way Jesus turned, and I'm not saying Jesus turned to be who he was just because Joseph was his dad, but he had to play a role, right? And I, I like to believe that when, when, when Jesus talks to his disciples and he introduces a new term to refer to God, the first time ever that this term was used was when Jesus was explaining to his disciples how to pray, and he says, when you pray, say, have a father. Daddy. And I like to believe that that's the kind of relationship he had with Joseph. And Joseph was so caring. He was not perfect, but he was so caring that he molded Jesus into having this caring and loving relationship. And I like to believe that Jesus grabbed from that influence and used it when explaining, when you refer to God, tell him, Daddy. When Jesus told the story of the prodigal son and the father is the hero of the story, always waiting for that kid. I like to believe that Jesus saw Joseph and the way he educated his brothers and sisters. Not him because he was perfect. <laughs> that had to be hard. Being the father of Jesus and he always being right and you always maybe not right. <laughs> that had to be hard. But let's just say that Jesus' brothers and sisters made some mistakes. And maybe the story of the prodigal son was influenced by Jesus watching Joseph and the way he did things with his brothers and sisters, the forgiveness, the mercy. I like to believe, and this is not what the Bible says, it's, I, I just like to believe that Joseph had a, a great impact in the life of Jesus. Because when you put your eyes on God and you learn to follow first, you will be a great leader in your house, in your family, everywhere you go. But it takes obedience, God. Guys, guys, God is asking you to do something. I don't know what it is, but you probably, you've been pounding these ideas in your mind, and you know that they're coming from God. You know that today when we were worshiping and, and they were calling you to the altar, there was tingling in your spirit, and you knew that there was something that you needed to do. God may be uh, telling you to renounce to some things, to start doing others. Just do it. Just do it. You see, guys, life is a magnificent journey filled with countless moments that shape our lives, our destinies. And there are thousands of crossroads where you have to decide if you want to obey God or not. But yet, all too often, we find ourselves hesitant, held back by fear and doubt, and we decide not to follow Jesus. And we miss out on the possibilities that are right before us. Today, God wants to remind you that the power to discover the plans He has for you actually is within you. All you have to say is, yes, Lord, like we were singing earlier, yes, Lord, I am available. Yes, Lord, I'm available. And get up and just do it. Each and every one of our purposes is unique. And God wired you with unique talents, skills, and passions that are waiting to be unleashed upon the world. But you have to obey. It's not enough to simply dream or wish to su succeed or wish to be this or wish to be that or wish to make changes. You must make action. And that's what we can learn from Joseph. He just took action. He obeyed, he listened, and he lived a simple life of obedience to the Lord. So, get up. Do it. Just do it. And I would like to close in prayer with you guys. And as the worship team comes, I think maybe God is challenging us to Stop asking questions. Stop complaining or making excuses. And just do it. And remember something. Running away from God. It's never going to lead to anything good. You're going to run around in circles and find yourself asking the same questions over and over again. 
If you're tired of that, it's, it's time for a change. It's time for trusting God and doing things His way and not our way. God has an amazing story lined up for your life. All it takes is for you to say, yes, Lord, I'm available. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it because you know better. You know better than me. So would you stand up? And I know we had a call to the altar earlier, but if there's anybody that needs prayer, and it, or if you're feeling that inside of you, I need to do something different in my life. I need to start saying yes to the Lord. And you want to come over here, we'll get the message. As soon as we see you coming, we'll pray for you. Somebody will jump right on and pray for you. We have our pastors here. But let me pray for us. And, and as we worship, let's be reminded that God is working. God is working. He will make a way. Maybe you're going through a struggle. Maybe you're going through a, through a scary time in your life. Maybe there's fear that is consuming your every day and you're anxious about it and you're feeling like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to, what's my life going to look like next year, in the next few days. God is going to make a way. God is going to make a way. And it's time for us to turn and say, God, what do you need? What do you need from me? What is your way? Let me start doing things your way, God. And then when he reveals that to you, just do it. Just do it. So, Father, I just ask, Lord, that you come in this place today. And you speak loudly, Lord, to our hearts. Father, I ask that your instructions will be echoing in our minds, in our hearts, in our souls, Lord. And that maybe some of the instructions and directions that you've been uh, giving us, Lord, and we've forgotten about them, Lord, come to life again. Father, we can, that we can not run away from your will anymore, Lord, that you can be so loud and clear, Lord, that we just don't have any choice than to say yes, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you speak to us, Lord, and you give us life. We want to hear you, Lord. We want to hear you. If there's anything that is holding us back from obeying you, Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you break with those chains, Lord. If there's fear in our hearts, Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you break those chains, Lord. We know that when we say yes to you, Lord, things can get difficult and Satan is going to try to destroy us, Lord. But I just ask, Lord, that you protect our hearts, Lord, so we can set our eyes on Jesus, Lord, and never look back. Never look back. Knowing that you have our back. Even if we step out of the boat and we start sinking, you have our back and you will hold our hand, Lord. Father, I just ask, Lord, that if there's anybody that is already took the decision of following you Lord and it's going through a struggle it's going through a storm it's going through uh, times of doubt and storm <laughs> I just ask Lord that you will speak to them today Lord and you remind them Lord that they made the right choice to follow you that they made the right choice to do things your way Lord and this also shall pass and they will see clear skies and the promise fulfilled in their lives Lord. thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus
these questions this week what is God asking for me am I doing it I've right? been putting things off for a long time just do it guys just do it you know we'll see you here next week it's our Christmas special yeah. celebration we're gonna have our Portuguese church join us and we're gonna have a, a bilingual uh, service and we're gonna have fun right same schedule 11 a.m. in the morning next Sunday God bless you, bring somebody to life, and just do it. Thanks again for joining us today. We're hoping that this message brought you to life. If you have any prayer requests or if you'd like to connect with our church family, you can email us at info at vibechurch.com or you can fill out the contact card section in our app. We're looking forward to hearing about all the ways that God is moving in your life. And until next time, go bring somebody to life.